Church is my favorite place in the world. Um, let me tell you a little bit of our story, my story. And then I've got, I hope, three points that you won't forget. Because what I want to do is just share a little bit of what's really exciting to me. What I'm learning right now. Isn't that good? You're always learning something from God. Yeah. And you should always be excited about something God is teaching you right now. And so I hope you, you, you get something from this. But um, I am just coming up to 70 years old. In April, I'll be 70. I don't know how I got this old. <laughs> Actually, I do. It took a long time. <laughs> but um, I was born and raised in Vancouver. And uh, second oldest of 11, big family. Yes, we were Catholic. <laughs> that was the, the second thing. Were you Catholic? Because back in those days, you know, the big families were. Um, but I was the bad boy in the family, which I was quite proud of that. And uh, punishment for me was if I was really bad, I, I had to go to church every day. So church was punishment. So I, I didn't grow up loving church. But I had a problem you know, growing up, and that's that I stuttered. I really, I couldn't talk. And so it basically ruled my life. If I had to, if going that way, I had to talk, I went that way. And when I was in grade 12, um, somebody said to me, there's a girl that likes you. Uh, you should go out with her. But that really did get my attention because I was afraid of girls. Never talked to a girl before. But then he said to me, eh, but, it, but if you do go out with her, don't mention God. She'll talk your ear off. She's one of those Christians. Well, I didn't know what a Christian was. I didn't know if I was a Christian. I went to church every Sunday in my life, but is, is that a Christian? Am I a Christian? Um, but there was something that was, uh, I just had to know. So I found her, and I kind of became a different person because I would typically never talk to anybody, but I found her and convinced her to skip out of school with me for the afternoon. <laughs> and uh, that was our first and her, she's right there, her name's Helen, my, my first, my only. And uh, yes, she did talk about Jesus, and, and I, I got to know Jesus, born again because of her, and uh, life changed. Um, I went to university and graduated in 1978 as a dentist. And um, we got married, and by the time I graduated, we had two little ones and one more on the way, and our four years into marriage, it was... It was broken. And it wasn't that there was abuse or any negative that way. It's just we did not know how to do this thing called a relationship, called marriage. We didn't know how to communicate. And um, I moved 500 kilometers away to build a new house and build a clinic and everything. And Helen, she wasn't coming. So she was going to stay in Vancouver Two little girls, one more on the way. And she has this epiphany moment with God where she looks at her big pregnant belly. She tells the story better than me, of course. But um, she looks, she says, God, how, how did this happen? How, how did I get here? This is not right. And, and she fell on her knees, opened the Bible, and it just became alive to her. And she thought God would be mad at her, but instead um, she just found out how much he loved her. And as she read the Bible more and more, she began to discover how much God really loved her. And then she had this another epiphany where she says, God, I know you love me, and I believe you love John. Would you, took the Bible, would you show me why? Because when she looked at me, she didn't see anything worth loving. But God looked at me different. And so she began to search the Bible. This is so important. Search the Bible for what does God see in her husband? For the man of God, the husband. And that's the first place we need to go for our relationships. What does God see? Because what we think this person is is what we see. But God sees his, his word is truth. And so she began to believe what God said about me. And everything began to change. And we, she moved up to where I was. We um, started going to this little church. And it changed our life. 
That's why I say church is my favorite place in the world. Church is miraculous in every way. Oh. I can't, I can never say it enough. I remember, um, you know, getting up early and going to church and I, I was afraid someone was going to ask me my name because I stuttered in that. But everything began to change as I heard the word of God. And as a result, we ended up planting a church ourselves. I was a, I was a dentist for 10 years, the last two of which I did both. Pastor planted a church and was a dentist. And then, um, so that was 37 years ago. And in 2019, I handed the baton of leadership in our church to my daughter. And I'm so glad that she's a she. Because <laughs> I really, <laughs> I, I, I really believe in um, the church rights the wrongs in our world today. And I don't know if you know this, but the single greatest um, abused people group on the planet are women. And in many countries in the world, just to hear, it's a girl, is a death sentence. And we, the church, need to right that wrong and recognize that God uses male and female, and we're blessed with, with the voice of women. So anyway, um, I handed the baton on to my daughter. And I think it's really important that we recognize that all of us have a baton. Okay, it's your life story. It's what you paid for. It's the, it's the, the, the blood, sweat, and tears that's brought you to where you're at now. And you didn't get here alone. You think about it, where you're sitting. Someone paid for this. Someone built this, this building. Someone paid for the ability for us in a nation like Canada to worship God. We didn't get here alone. And when we leave, we need to take what God's done in and through our life and pass that on to the generations. And so... Life's this amazing, great big story, and it's miraculous. I love the worship this morning. As we just, you know, Holy Spirit, come. Do what you do. Do miracles. You know, we weren't born again into a natural life. It's a supernatural life. And we need to expect that. We, we need to come to church and recognize the Bible says where two or three are gathered. There he is. Did you recognize he's here? Yeah. He's here. He is here. Yeah. Okay, sometimes we just get, you know, we kind of take it for granted. You know, we're in church again. We've been done this before. We got it all figured out. No, no, no. It's, it's new every day. And I love that, Pastor, that you talked about honor. Because recognize, I think that's such a powerful, you, you actually brought, it was Mark chapter 6, the verse, verse 5 verses where it says Jesus is ministering in his own hometown. Miracles are happening until somebody says, hold it. I know this kid. He's the carpenter's kid. Who do you think you are? And from that, I just think it's so amazing. From that point on, Jesus could not, not would not, could not do any more great things. Why? Because they counted him as normal. They, they didn't honor him they dishonored him by by looking at him as common thinking this is this is common we've been to church before this is normal no don't ever do that and I'm going to talk about one of the keys that I've been learning and why I get so excited about this it's there's a miracle in awe in awe and in to be in awe is your choice you could be bored with anything or you could stand in awe of what God is doing right now. You could not waste a moment of your life. And it is so miraculous. But we do have a baton, all of us, to pass that baton. And what that baton is, is your blood, sweat, and tears. You know what it is? It's your love. See, Jesus said in John chapter 13, he says, By this all will know that you're my disciples. Okay, how do people know that there's... a a God in heaven, and that you serve a God? What? By the way we love one another. And our love for one another costs us. 
You know, love that doesn't cost is just a feeling. It's just goosebumps. It's not love. Love's always going to cost us. But, but it never just dies with us. We pass it on. And the reason I pass that baton on to my daughter is that she knows what it cost. She recognized the, the, the price I paid for that. And life is like a relay for all of us. And you have a baton, okay? And when your life is over, that baton needs to be passed on. And if that relay, if it's passed and it's dropped, the relay is over. You can't drop the baton. But, but how do people know not to drop it? They know what it costs. They know what it costs. So don't be afraid to pay a price. Don't be afraid to, 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 to love hard, to love difficult. Don't be afraid to, to love till it hurts. And don't be afraid that, that people will see it. They need to see it, especially your kids. Because one day, they'll actually take the story and keep writing your story. But you're not writing your story all alone. You have a story before you. Find out what chapter you know, your, your story is in that book. <clears throat> I love passing the baton on because for, I don't know, probably all my Christian life, my favorite verse has been Proverbs 13, 22, where it says a good man or a good woman leaves an inheritance to his children or her children's children. I don't know if you're a good man or woman until I see your grandchildren. In other words, it's not about us. It's about the generations. Come on. It's about the generations. I believe Weston Row Church is a great church, but I really don't know until I see two or three generations from now. What we're doing is, is leaving a legacy. We're actually doing something that's going to make a difference for eternity. And I do believe every one of us, every single one of us, God's called us to change the world. Really, change the world. You can do it. it it's, it's just one person at a time. But after you leave, the world should be changed and should be better. So there's three things I wanted to leave with you today that are, I think are miraculous. So I'm calling this three miraculous life keys. Okay? So this life we live is a miracle life. There's so many things about it that are so miraculous. And number one is the miracle of community. You should never, ever take for granted the ability we have to build relationships and to be part of relationships. That's called community. You know, Jesus said, I will build my church, which is community. Church is miraculous. He said he's going to, be here because we're gathered together in his name. And we need to recognize the miracle of community. Yeah. Yesterday, we, we talked about marriage. And, you know, the Bible tells us that God takes two and makes them into one. I don't know about you, but that's miraculous to me. I was talking to one couple that had won't be, you know, been married for four years. And I was, I was just explaining to them, but you, you know that, that, that you're not the same as you used to be. It used to be single you and single you. Now it's the together, a brand new creation, a brand new miraculous creation. There's a book that was written by James Buckner, who's an Old Testament theologian. And he asserts that healing and health is not individual and biological as much as it is communal and relational. So interesting. In the New Testament, the, the, the word used for family is sometimes translated healing. Healing comes in relationship. Relationships can cause problems, but they are the, the answer to problems. Amen. Healing comes in relationships. And we were never created to be alone. God created Adam, and he was alone. And God said, not good. Why? Because you're alone. So he creates relationships, and we get to be part of that, and it is supernatural in every way. You know, one of the things that is interesting, um, I love studying the brain, and there was a study done in Vancouver 
Simon Fraser University, back 40 years ago. And it was called the, the Rat Park Study. And it was done with rats, so it's called the Rat Park Study. But the end result of it is they came out of it with this. Um, the medical, uh, professional, psychological world no longer says that sobriety is the answer to addiction. Now they say community is the answer to addiction. Do you have anybody in your world struggling with addiction? The answer is community. We need to pull them in and make them part of what we're doing. Be part of them so they can be part of you. This ability that God gives us to actually become one, it's miraculous in every way. When, when the two become one, there's this ability we have to walk a mile in their shoes. In other words, to see the world through their eyes. I'll never forget, if you've heard me before, I almost always tell the story of um, my oldest daughter, who's now our lead pastor. She's my boss and my pastor. But when she was eight years old, I took her on a date. And it was like, I never heard of it before, just a cool idea. And I bought this card and said, put it on her pillow and said, Dear Angela, would you please be my special date Thursday night? Love, Daddy. And I got home and, and I come in the front door and I looked up and out stepped the queen. <laughs> she had the perfect hair, you know, the daddy dress, lots of frills. And she started walking down the stairs. It's the wedding walk. <laughs> Every little girl practices that for the most important man in her world. And I was surprised it was me. Went up, put my best black suit on, took my date by the arm, opened the car door, we went to this place, had a, a great meal. And then I thought, how do you talk to an eight-year-old? <laughs> really, honestly, how do you talk to an eight-year-old? Because I was so involved in my life. I mean, I was a dentist. I was this, I was that, and all the rest of it. She's just a little girl. But I, I, I actually tried to talk to this eight-year-old, and she opened up. You know what intimacy is? It's into me see. And she let me in. And I made this discovery. Everyone's got their own world. And they want you in. But you don't get in unless you want to know, unless you want in. But once you do, you begin to see life through their eyes. And you know, a big life, God wants us to live a big life, is not a life with lots of stuff. It's a life with, with lots of people in your heart and you in their heart. And that's what relationship does. It gives you that ability to see a bigger world the way that God wants us to see that world. You think about community. It's, it's every one of us individuals. Every one of us different. Every one of us amazing. But we're together. And together, it's miraculous. It's like a symphony orchestra. You know, if you just listen to a flute, it sounds great all by itself. But put it in a symphony orchestra, and wow. And the conductor of our symphony is the Holy Spirit. And as he conducts us, we're all on the same road. And I love that. We're all on the same road. You know what that's called? It's called alignment. The Holy Spirit is the conductor called alignment. And on the same road means we're not the same. We're just going to the same place. We're just growing the same, to be like Jesus the same. And in that place, it's miraculous in so many ways. Jesus said, I'll build my church. And then he sent the Holy Spirit to lead us and to give us that together. Angela, um, when she became our lead pastor, she gave us a number of statements which would frame our church. And the first one she gave us is we value alignment over agreement. I love that. Agreement is like, well, we've got to think the same. No, you don't. We all got to agree in everything. No, you don't. 
We just need to be going together. And as we're going together, you want to look at so many different, so many amazing, crazy, age-wise different, as the pastor's already talked about, um, backgrounds from where we come from, languages we speak, all of those different. But we're going the same way, the same place. That's the miracle of community. The second miracle I want to talk about is the miracle of wonder or the miracle of awe. I love to stay, to stay in awe. And the answer to not honoring is awe. <laughs> they, they dishonored Jesus because they treated him as common. The opposite of that is to go, oh, wow, this is, this is the Son of God, this is Jesus. And when we treat people as amazing, the benefit goes to us. People have asked many times over the years, how do you stay in love for a lifetime? Easy. Stay amazed. Stay in awe. It's the miracle of wonder. You know, when I went through university, that was way back. I graduated in 1978. But um, in those days, uh, we believed that when you were born, you only had a certain number of neurons, cells up here. And <laughs> really good news, from the moment you're born, they start die dying. You get less and less all the time. And, and, and we believed you, you'd never got any more. You were born with them, and that was it. But now we understand some new things, which is really amazing what happens in your brain. Do you know that you can actually generate new neurons? Do you know that, um, for instance, um, they have taught people that are blind how to see. Why? Because you don't see with your eyes, you see with your brain. So, so many different things, and I, I, I can't go into all of it, but it's just amazing the things that we've now discovered. And one of the things we've discovered is the ability to generate new neurons. Call that neurogenesis, okay? What causes new neurons to be generated? And there's two things. One it's interesting, is fasting. If you fast for 24 hours, food and water, while meditating on something. So take the word of God, take, take something that you're fasting and you're, you're praying, you're meditating on this. Actually, your brain is coming alive. Your brain is in, in have you ever watched children learning? Isn't it amazing how all children love to learn? Why did you get old? <laughs> Why did you stop wanting to learn? We should be children all our life long. Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you know, you, you can actually have that excitement. But you watch a child that's learning, and you can actually see the firecrackers going off in their brain, right? It's, it's like, psh, 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 psh. What's happening is there's, new, there's neurons that are joining up and new synapses that are happening. And, you know, they're, they're forming the way they think, which is actually the person they're becoming. And you don't ever have to stop that. And actually, neurogenesis, the second thing, first is, is, is fasting. But the second thing is this a wonder. For instance, if you... Take time and watch a sunrise and be in awe. <laughs> or watch a sunset and you're in awe. There is neurogenesis going on in your brain. <laughs> and, and, and there's a newness happening to you. And I believe that is a key. That's a miraculous key of a way that, the way that we should live our life. And it's called a way of honor. Never, ever, ever think that it, this is just common. Yeah. Another day, well, it's just another day. No, it isn't. This is the day the Lord has made. And I will rejoice in this day. And I will expect miracles in this day. And I will look with, with, with excitement. And I'll look with anticipation and expectation. Great things are going to happen. Expect around every corner there's a miracle waiting for you. That's the way God's created us to live. Look at a little child. Jesus said, unless you become like a little child. That's what children are. You ask a, 
I, and I love four-year-olds. Four, I love them all, but four-year-old is the magic age. In four years, they become a real person. <laughs> Before that, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're thinking and everything, but so much of it is what mom and dad say. But at four, they begin to think on their own. Ask a four-year-old, what are you going to be when you grow up? And you can see the firecrackers go off. <laughs> they're going to be the president. They're going to be whatever it is, that is, and it changes every day. <laughs> Jesus said, you, you got to become like a little child. Why did we stop expecting? Why did we stop being in awe? Why did we get boring? <laughs> it's amazing. You know, if you ask a lot of children, what do you think about adults? You know what word they use? Boring. <laughs> Why do you think they say boring? Could it be that we look bored? We stopped learning. We stopped expecting. We should wake up every day with a, wow, I get to do this today. I get to go to church today. 37 years ago when we started our church, at that time, um, a lot of the churches that I knew or the the pastors that I knew, you know, their practice was um, they would stay in their office in prayer until the preliminaries had finished. They call that the, you know, the, the, the music, all of that. And when it was time for the man of God to come out, they, that's when they would come out of their office and up on the platform and ready to preach. <laughs> I, I am I'm not saying, I don't want you to think negative of them. I'm just, it was funny to me. Not, not me. I didn't want to do that. You know where I wanted to be Sunday morning? At the front door. And I just was so excited to see they came back. Yes, they came back. Yes. And the kids, this is true. The kids, the kids would get out of the car and run to me. And, I, you know, give me a big hug. And, and, and I don't know why. Maybe they, they saw that I was just a big kid. But never do whatever you do boringly. Is that a word? (laughs) Stay in awe. Live this miraculous life of wonder. Never, never get into the dishonor. You think about it. Because they dishonored Jesus, he could not. Isn't it amazing that somebody handcuffed God How do you handcuff God? Just by dishonoring, by not seeing the wonder and the amazement of this moment. You know, as parents, let me just encourage you as parents, you have a huge role to play in helping your children become the person that they're going to be. And as those synapses are firing in their brain, and they're, they're, they're trying, they're thinking, they're, 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 you know, testing this, this, this. When you see them think something the right way, be as fast as you can to praise them, to build them up, to congratulate them. And what you will do is, is fortify that thought pathway. And in your brain, you know what that's called? Every neuron in your brain, is, it's, like a, a, it's like a road, you know, where a, a thought goes across this road. But there's roads that are super fast. And what makes them super fast is they have a coating around that nerve called myelin. It's the miracle of myelin. <laughs> you know, have you ever seen how sometimes birds in thousands will fly in, what's it called, Helen? A murmuration. A murmuration. Have you seen that? There are thousands of them. They're all... And and when I first saw that, I go, wow. You know, physiologically, how that's done? It's called the miracle of myelin. Those those motor nerves in those birds are firing so fast, it's almost the speed of light, that you can't tell one of them made a change and everybody followed. But in our life, that that myelin actually causes us to have superhighways. And those are the personality ways 
Those are our subconscious that we begin to, to build. So when, when, like most of us in the room, you don't think about what you do. 99% of what you do is already all thought through and you got these super highways in your brain, but those are what creates the personality of who you are and you get to help your kids. Because when you stop them and praise them for you're so kind, that was so loving. That was so generous. A lot of parents, the only times you hear them praise their kids is, you're so tall. They did nothing to get tall. <laughs> you're so beautiful. They did nothing to get beautiful. Take time to praise them for the thoughts and the person they're becoming. Always stay in awe of all of that that God is doing in their life. Amen. Call out their giftings. Oh, just again, I get into the parent thing a lot, but, but let, let me help you. Call out their giftings. Like, giftings, again, are something that God gave them. They didn't do anything, but they need to believe they have those giftings. And here's another thing. I would really encourage you, if you've got more than one child, ask for their help. Say you've got um, a 12-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter. Talk to the 12-year-old. Say, I, I, I need your help. Can you help me? I need, we need to watch and see what God's put in your sister. And when you see those giftings, those callings in her, can you help me call those? Just tell her what they are. I see that in you. I see this gifting in you. Because when they get older, it's funny how that verse where the, you know, Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, in his own family. How as we get older and our kids grow up, there is a, a, a built-in almost dishonor. Because they treat them as normal. I've known you all my life. Teach them how to, to see their brothers and sisters as the miracles that God's created them to be. Okay, the third one, the last one, is the miracle in a moment. Okay, the miracle in a moment. What do you mean by that? There's right now the opportunity to say something, to do something, to think something that will change the world. But, you know, it happens every moment. And we miss almost all of them. Why? Because we're not expecting anything. We just think this is another moment. And we need to be ready and willing to grab a moment. Every moment is pregnant with opportunities. Okay? But we miss them if we're not expecting them. But if we recognize God has given us this day, this is the day the Lord has made, and it's full of opportunities. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 that we should look circumspectly. You know what that means? 360 degrees. Keep your eyes open, looking for what is God doing? What is God opening up right now that can make a difference in the world, that I could do right now, that I could say right now, Something. Yeah. Grab a moment. And this is my, my way of how, how do you change the world? Simple. Grab a moment and pour your heart into it. Grab a moment pour your heart into it. You don't change the world with your head. You don't change the world with your talent. You change the world with love. Amen. And love that doesn't cost is just a goosebump, a feeling. So grab a moment and pay the price. Grab a moment and say something that needs to be said. I tell the story of my dad, and you've probably heard it. The guys heard it yesterday, how um, I grew up in this family. I never heard I love you, never heard I'm proud of you. And a number of years ago on Father's Day, I called my dad. And I said, hi, Dad, how are you? Happy Father's Day. And that's normal. You're supposed to do that. Everybody does that. You know, if you just keep on doing what everybody does, just keep on doing what you're supposed to do. Just keep on doing what everybody expects you to do. No one sees anything. You become invisible. You don't change the world. That You have to actually grab the opportunity to do something different, to do something that, that needs to be done that's not been done. 
So my dad would say, hey, oh, thanks, John. And he's ready to hang up. And I said, dad, 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 what, what? Don't hang up. Why? Well, I just want to say something. What? I just want to say, I'm glad you're my dad. I love you. And there's this silence on the other end of the phone. We don't talk like that. And then he says to me, I'm glad you're mine too. I love you too. Click. <laughs> that night we went to my brother's house and there's with five brothers and five sisters, there's 90 of us. It's a crowd. It's called peer pressure. You walk into the room and my dad saw me walk through the crowd all the way to me, put his arms around me, gave me a kiss and said to me, have I ever told you how proud of you? I get choked up even now thinking about it. How proud of you I am. No. He said, look at me. I want you to see I love you. Don't you ever forget it. You know, from that moment on, he never left his presence where he didn't tell me that. But not just me, all my siblings. Literally changed the world. Why? Because just did something. Grabbed a moment. And poured my heart into it. In 2008, my brother, Joe, I uh, was on the golf course one morning and the marshal drives up and says, um, Dr. Burns, there's an emergency phone call from your wife. So I called her and she said, your brother Joe's in the hospital and they found him with his heart had stopped last night and they didn't know how long his heart had stopped and whether his brain had made it or not. And so I'm on my way to the hospital and all I could think of was one more moment. God, if I could just have one more moment with Joe. Then you think, what, what would you say? Actually, if you ever get to that place in your life, it's, it's an easy question to answer. I would have told him, Joe, I love you. I don't know if I'd ever said that to him. I would have told him, Joe, I'm proud of you. I don't know if I'd ever. And more importantly, Joe, God loves you. And he's made a way for you. And... Anyway, I got to the hospital, and it was too late. Two days later, we unplugged him, watched him take his last breath. And uh, I flew off to Uganda and got back in time for the funeral. Called my sister the night before the funeral and said, so what am I doing at the funeral? And she says, you're not allowed to do anything. Um, I don't know if it was a priest or whatever, but I wasn't allowed to do anything. But Joe's wife asked me to say something, so I have to say something. At the funeral, the place is packed. My brother really was a hero. He was a little league baseball coach, and the, line, the aisle was lined with, with little league baseball players, and uh, it, was, it was huge. We're sitting up there, and the priest gets to the place where he says, at this time, I'd like to call on Joe's two sisters to come and share the eulogy. Would you come now? And my sisters, Rose and, and Marianne, get up, and I just got up behind them. <laughs> I, I've learned it's a lot easier to get forgiveness than permission. <laughs> and you should have seen Helen's eyes. So I walked behind my sisters all the way up to the pulpit and they stepped up and shared the eulogy and I, after they stepped down, I stepped up and I said, hi everybody, my name's John, I'm Joe's brother, obviously, he looks like me. Um, and when I heard that Joe's heart had stopped, all I could think of is one more moment. I thought, what, what, what would I say? And I, that's so easy. I would have told Joe, I love you and I'm proud of you. Then I thought, if Joe had one more moment, what would he say? I know what he'd say. He would have talked to and his wife's Diane. I said, Diane, he would have told you how much he adores you and loves you. And then Joe's got three teenage boys, which, like I said, we don't talk like this. So I don't know if they'd ever heard this either. But, I, you know, dad would have said to you, I'm so proud of you, all of you. And I love you. But then I looked at everybody and said, you know what? I don't have one more moment. Not with Joe. But how many Joes do you have in your world? Why wait? From that moment, 
our family. We get together, and when, when we do, usually someone's asking, could, could I have one more moment? I just say something that needs to be said. How many sons, daughters have not heard, I love you, I'm proud of you? How many dads, moms haven't heard it? How many Joes do you have in your world? Why wait? You got a moment. Every moment's pregnant with miracle ability. And some of them are so simple, just words. Words that'll change the world. But you gotta grab that opportunity. And you gotta do what's not easy and what's not normal. We don't talk like that. Well, then change. Change. Say what needs to be said. It's not what you want to say. It's what that need to be said. What people need to hear. Literally, today. I wrote a book called The Miracle in a Daddy's Hug. And it talks about my middle daughter and, and the miracle that happened one day because she went through an eating disorder and, and, and I didn't know how to deal with it. Finally, I just put my arms around her and just held her and cried. And she got baptized in daddy's love. And I've taught that all over the world. And you, you would be so surprised how often I'll get to a church and I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, if you're here and you've never had dad give you a hug and tell you, how proud of you he is. Could I take his place? And the altar is packed. Two-thirds of the people end up coming. And some of them, like, I remember one place, this, this, he was, I think he was close to 90. He could hardly breathe. He was crying so hard. He never had heard that before. Simple things. Opportunities to change the world. There's, it's a miraculous life we lead. Don't ever take it for granted. Recognize that we get to be part of each other. Recognize that in this moment, there's a miracle. Right now, I want to pray for you. And you know what? I believe God can do miracles right now in our life and through our life. I believe if you will receive, God will put something in you that you can pass on, give to somebody else that will change their world. Can I invite you just to bow your heads, close your eyes. Let me pray for you. So, Father, you know every single one of us and you know the worlds that we live in. We all have different worlds, but you're in them all. And we need you. We've already saying how much we need you right now. So Holy Spirit, come into our world. Lead us and guide us. Show us the miraculous way that we can make a difference, that we can live this moment right now. If there's anybody in the room and there's a question mark in your heart and mind. If you are a child of God, if you were to step out of this world like Joe into eternity, you don't know where you'd go? Question mark. Is heaven your home? If you're not sure, you need to get sure. You need that. And all you need to do is open your heart and right now, allow Jesus to be that miracle in your life. I want to pray a simple prayer for you. If that's you, I'm going to invite you to pray along. You may be here and, and you recognize that there is this opportunity. God's actually speaking to you about a person or persons that you could just grab a moment and pour your heart into it. Maybe pick up the phone or maybe drop by. Maybe do what, what needs to be done, which is not normal. But it can, it can change everything. And right now, if you'd say yes to God, I believe the Holy Spirit will give you the strength and the power to do that. 
It's a commitment that you make to him. And I'm going to pray a simple prayer for you in a minute. And I'm, I'm, I'm believing that you will make the commitment. It's not just a good idea. It's a commitment that changes everything. So right now, all over the room, I invite you to pray along with me. If you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just pray along. If you've never asked him into your heart, say this loud enough for your ears to hear what you're saying. And then every single one of us, I'll give you opportunity for you to let God know who it is and what that commitment is that you can leave this place with his power and his strength to accomplish. Everyone say this, Lord Jesus. I believe in you. You're my Lord, my Savior. You died on the cross to take my place. And right now, I receive you. Thank you, Jesus. I ask you for strength. I believe you're asking me to make a difference in my world. And then you go ahead and tell God right now in your own words what it is you're believing he's asking you. And the, let's all say, so right now, I believe by your spirit, I have the power and I am committed. And I thank you for the miracle. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap, church. God bless you.